Um, okay, now the embarrassing part's over. Now we're being recorded. <laughs> Assuming everybody can see and it's all good, I will go ahead and start. So welcome everybody and thank you for tuning in, those who are on the Zoom. Um, the few I haven't met, Madam, Restoration Coordinator for the site, and today I'm going to be talking to you about evolutionary anachronisms. Um, so I hope the title did not scare too many of you away. Uh, it's sound... <laughs> Sounds a lot worse than it is. It's actually a really interesting uh, concept. I'm excited to share with you guys because I think it's really cool. And it's something I've kind of taken like a deep dive into this year. And so yeah, it should be it should be fun. I, I promised I was not going to do what I did with the Moss presentation and talk about talk about it excitedly for an hour and a half. We're gonna try to keep it a little shorter. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions or anything, um, just feel free to stop me along the way. Um, oh, uh, quick plug for our next enrichment next month. Um, <laughs> um, the October enrichment, uh, I can't, I don't know the date off the top of my head, but it's uh, our resident volunteer photographer, Rich Blosser. We've used his pictures for everything. Uh, he was the calendar picture like a couple years ago, but he'll be doing an in-person only enrichment on um, nature photography. So sign up, get your cameras, come out, learn how to take awesome pictures. And then maybe you, maybe you can make the next LREC calendar. <laughs> okay. Anything else? All right, great. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. There's it's Kind of a it's it's kind of a big a big topic um, a lot a lot of parts a lot of different concepts to um, to learn about but I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible because um, like I said it's really cool really interesting so we're gonna take it slow and either way into it so a little bit of bot oh come on botany 101 so what is a fruit anybody. Yogurt. Fruits and ovary. Anybody else? Someone that doesn't work here. <laughs> the tongue, so. I can tell you what. <laughs> yes, yeah, so fruit is, in, is a, the part of the flowering plant, like post fertilization. It's the whatever contains the seed, um, which is what I'm going to be focusing on for the majority of this talk. And specifically, we're going to be looking at fleshy fruits. So the, the nice big the tasty things that most people eat, most people associate with the word fruit, in the, even in a non-botanical sense. So as you can see here, uh, basic anatomy of appears to be a peach. Um, you have the seed in the middle part here, which is the endosperm and embryo and whatnot. And then all around this outside, you have this, you have uh, quite a bit of like this thick um, edible flesh. And this part of the seed does not do anything to help that seed germinate. So the seed itself does not need this covering. Um, basically, the only purpose this serves is to attract an animal to eat it. This so idea is if the plant invests a lot of time and, or a lot of energy into creating all of this uh, pulpy, fleshy, tasty material to bribe an animal to come eat it, eat the fruit and then disperse the seed elsewhere, thus like spreading its range. So the seeds don't just like fall on the ground right around the parent tree. And that's going to be the key to this whole thing is dispersal, like mechanisms of seed dispersal, specifically by animals eating it. I did put this screenshot from this article in here just because of the title, because it's awesome. Um, but basically, <laughs> but basically, yes, large seeded plants, produce fleshy fruits to entice animals to eat them, deposit the seed via poop, as, we're, as we all know. So knowing that if you see a fruit on the ground that you don't know, um, let's say you don't, you, 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 you're walking along, I guess in Southeast Asia and you see this on the ground, you're like, huh, okay. Well, this is obviously a fruit and it's a fleshy fruit, so it's something, it has evolved for something to eat it. 
but what what could possibly be eating that? I and I'm just realizing now I have the title up there. So um, <laughs> so certain key things we're gonna we're gonna look at um, in regards to sea dispersal by mammals. So what if that title wasn't there? What would tell you that this is um, this is something dispersed by a mammal? So a couple things you look at. First of all, the dull color. Um, Mammals have relatively poor color vision. They don't often rely on like looking for fruits to find their food, um, but they do uh, rely on aroma. So most mammal, most like uh, mammal dispersed fruits either smell really good or really bad because they were like walking around, they'll, they'll just sniff around and like see and like that will lead them to where food sources are. And fibrous and fibrous pulp is another giveaway. If you break the fruit open, you see it has a lot of fiber in there. A lot of birds and reptiles and things that also might eat fruits do not have the the right the real like digestive like microbiome to process that fibery material. Mammals do, so that's why it's important. That's why you know we need to eat our fiber. Yeah, you got your your oatmeal and your fiber one bars because it's our gut bacteria can actually process that material and it's good for us. So. Fibery pulps, like a, another big giveaway, and of course the, oops, of course the tough rind and pod. Um, so like, really, like it doesn't make a lot of sense for a plant to invest the energy making that thick rind just so a bird can come and peck a hole in it and like eat the eat the seeds or whatever out of it. So if it has like a really thick rind on it, chances are it's probably um, something meant to be eaten by. And like a big with big mouth, strong jaws, it'll just crunch up that rind. So now, what kind of mammals do you think might have eaten this? Um, so seasonal example, you've probably seen this. As, you'll probably see this at some point if you leave pumpkins out. Um, as you can see, the pumpkin meets a lot of those criteria. So um, I guess not so much dull color, although this is a cultivar, like yeah. Uh, right. A lot of wild gourd types look like this. You can see it on the zoom, a uh, pretty dull color, um, thick rind, fibrous pulp, lots of seeds on the inside. But again, we are thinking about dispersal, right? So if you are a pumpkin vine and you spend months of growth energy making this giant pumpkin only for a squirrel to come and sit in there and just eat the seeds and leave the rest of it just on the ground and not disperse your genes, that's kind of a waste of time. So we, although like mammals, there's there are these big fruits that mammals, that small mammals will eat, that's not actually being dispersed anyway, right? Because again, we want, we are enticing the creators to come eat our fruits to carry the seeds elsewhere. So not a good dispersion. In fact, it's probably eating a bunch of the seeds. So if you're if whatever eats your fruit is also destroying your seeds, that's that's just a bad investment, right? And so then because it's a cultivar, maybe the the unhybridized, uncultivated had a thicker uh, outside that made this not possible. Could that be? Um quite possibly. That's, um, that's a evolutionary dead end right there. So that yeah. well is it? I mean it's net like those seeds if that if that squirrel chews them up and only poops out part mm -hmm. and not viable seeds that that so then that didn't work for that pumpkin. So for those on the zoom um question was raised like it seems like an evolutionary dead end for a pumpkin to have these features to like for squirrels, since they're not officially, they're not like the target, they're not like a really good disperser, which is a good point. And it's key to the next point. So this type of fruit isn't actually made for squirrels. What it's really made for is this, right? You want something that's going to just shove the whole fruit in their mouth and then go about their day, disperse it elsewhere. So things like, uh, Elephants and hippos. By the way, um, if you've never Googled uh, videos of zookeepers throwing entire melons and pumpkins into hippos' mouths, it is awesome. <laughs> and it's spectacular and a little scary. Hippos are like, hippos are pretty terrifying, actually. Um, 
So yeah, these, so like the traits we're talking, the traits I'm going to specifically talking about are those adapted to attract megafauna mammals. So loosely, this is anything, any animals in adult weight over a hundred pounds um, or equal to or greater than that of a person. But typically it's reserved for much larger, things much larger than persons. It's like these guys that weigh tons. So what are the keys? Uh, what could clue you in to um, that a fruit might be adapted to be dispersed by megafauna? So, I mean, the first key is the size, like if it's big, like big fruit meant to be eaten completely and dispersed out, you need a big mouth to put it in, right? So pretty obvious. Another one is indehiscent, which this is also related to most other fruits. Um, so that just means that the, the uh, mature fruit does not split open and reveal its seeds when it's ripe which you think about it like you want, like you're investing all this time to make this pulp that animals are going to eat and along with the seeds. So if your fruit opens up and the seeds are exposed or left out, then there's really no point in making a bunch of pulp for us to entice something to eat it. Um, another thing is the some, a lot of the times the seed will have some kind of physiological uh, mechanism to avoid being ground up by teeth. So if you have a large animal that's eating that whole fruit, probably going to have like really big strong teeth and kind of defeats the purpose if they're also grinding up your seeds. So a lot of them will have like either a very, very tough seed coat. Um, sometimes they'll have like a really slippery coating right around the seed or like the seed is difficult to separate from the pulp. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever uh, eaten a pawpaw right. and you've tried to like like extract the seed, like you can tell like that slippery coating, that arrow is kind of hard, it takes some work to get, and like like a like an animal's not gonna take the time to do that. It's just gonna either like spit it out or just swallow it and move on. Uh, another thing you'll see is they'll have like really bitter or toxic compounds in the seeds. So even if um, they don't like slip through the teeth, like if uh, some seeds, like even though like the outside flesh it was really like good tasting, if you bite into the seed, it's like a really gross, bitter, icky compound. If you ever, um, if you ever eaten lychees or rambutans, um, those little tropical fruits, uh, they look really weird and like Dr. Susi. Um, that outside coating is really good, but if you bite into that seed, it's real bad. It's gross because you're not supposed to chew the seed. You're supposed to pass it or spit it out. Um, and if they do have a tough seed coat, usually they'll need some kind of abrasion to uh, weaken it to germinate. So, you know, we don't want the seed to be ground up by the teeth, uh, but we do want, but it, it does have to be able to pass through an animal. So, so the, the, do the uh, acids from the stomach provide the abrasion? Yep, yeah, either that or just like, like the light grind, because like, the teeth, the seeds are still going to hit the teeth and like be like ground up a little bit, but not to the point where they're completely destroyed. So that and the um, yeah, like passing through the digestive tract, you get like the stomach acids that weaken that seed coat and help germination. So again, if you've ever tried to grow pawpaw from seed, like you need to like you'll either need to like take some sandpaper to it, rub it a little bit, or do it the old-fashioned way and <laughs> pass it on through. <laughs> And another another good indicator um, is you usually see the fruit on the ground when it's ripe. So a lot of these trees tend to be kind of big, and even if like you're a like a really big uh, elephant or something, your reach is only so high, and there's still going to be a lot of fruit in the canopy that you won't be able to reach. So if it but if it falls to the ground, it's just all over the place. Then you're going to have a much easier time just scooping it all up. And the kinds and um, See, that's just general megafauna, but we're not, not going to focus on like uh, just any megafauna. What we're really going to look at is uh, these guys, the previous megafauna of North America. And really, when you use the term megafauna, this is kind of what most people are referring to, like these Pleistocene era animals that are no longer around. At least I haven't seen any. Except, well, there's bison. Bison is still around. Um, so Pleistocene, if you remember your, uh, his, your uh, historical epoch time periods from Anthropology 101, Pleistocene 
uh, two and a half million to almost 12,000 years ago. Uh, ended with the quaternary extinction event um, about 50 to 10,000 years ago, which is like end of the Pleistocene into the what's called the Holocene, which is kind of where what we're in now, although some people say we've moved past it into what's known as the Anthropocene. But um, basically the Holocene is when humans really started uh, dispersing and taking over. So yeah, most of these things, as we know, died out during this extinction event. Uh, few, like a few different theories as to why the two main ones are climate change, of course, um, you know, changing like landscape scale changes, mostly because of the movement and or retreat of glaciers, um, changing the climate, making it uh, not ideal for these large animals. The other one is called the prehistoric overkill hypothesis, which is basically once humans showed up in North America, uh, we, we kind of went a little nuts with the hunting, right? Um, that one's a little more controversial. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but I mean, tr and truthfully, it's probably not any one cause. It's probably like a multitude of reasons why this happened in a relatively short time frame. I mean, 40,000 years is a long time, but like on a geologic scale, it's really not, it's really not that long. And it's quick enough to where um, there's really no succession. So nothing, so like these animals died out and nothing really replaced them. So what we have are these uh, traits that, so like these animals like evolved over millions of years along with the plants of that time. And then they, the animals all disappeared quickly, but the plants are still there and they might carry some of those traits. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit later. But first, we're going to give some examples um, of, what of the kinds of animals we're looking at, right? So we, we all know our former native elephants, our mastodons, and our mammoths. Another one that came up a lot is gomphotheres, which is these really wacky looking uh, elephant things. They're like slightly smaller than mastodons, um, live in like these op like open wooded edges. Um, very important dispersers of a lot of a lot of fruits. Uh, everyone's favorite, the giant ground sloths, relatives of the tree sloths in Central and South America, but much, much bigger. And they live on the ground, as their name implies. Um, this is like the nicest picture I could find. Some of them, because like obviously we don't know if they had long, shaggy hair. So some of them, some artist renderings were like of them with like no hair or like really short hair is like, that's less cute. This is funny. <laughs> and then uh, last we have camels. So North American camels um, also died out during this period. Um, and those, they're actually a pretty important component of like historical like savannas and grasslands. So there've been people that have suggested if you want to have like functional grazing as part of like your, your ecosystem that you're restoring, instead of cattle or horses or like goats or whatever, we should be bringing camels in because camels were actually here. So if anybody wanted to get camels at Litzinger, I, I, there's a pretty good reason for it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Okay, so we're getting a little, little deeper into the meat of this talk. So we're, this thing um, we're talking about is evolutionary ecological anachronisms, which is this concept developed by these two guys, Dan Jansen and Paul Martin. If you Google this phrase, evolutionary anachronism, these two guys' names will come up in everything. So they first um, sort of formulated this concept and published it in a 1982 paper, though this one on the right, uh, the fruits that Gompathiers ate, and then various like more casual articles that have fun titles like fruits for famous mammoths. But they're really the first one to really put this idea out there. And for like, and it has since like been mostly accepted. So we're talking about plant traits that have developed through, through evolutionary relationships with these extinct animals um, that are no longer here. So, I mean, if you compare them to like the current large herbivores of our times, so like, uh, mostly deer, um, to a lesser extent bison. Um, they just seem, they have things that just seem a little overbuilt or is like, was this really like, this doesn't seem like it was meant for like a deer or a bison or anything that's alive today. Like this looks like something 
Um, although that was from a different time, one of my favorite ones is it's conspicuously old fashioned, <laughs> right? So it doesn't quite jive with the modern era. Uh, does anybody know what these are? Yeah, coal chutes, right? So live in St. Louis, a lot of brick, a lot of old brick houses with these coal chutes on here. Um, so these were really common, but what happened are but like our our power grid changed, our methods for heating our home changed, and nobody really needs nobody I know has coal delivered to their house anymore. But these are still there. So if you had like a, I guess, older contracted company that was building new houses, but still putting coal chutes on them, you'd be like, why? Like, why, why are you doing this? And that would be an anachronistic trait. So something that's at once served a purpose in its time, but now uh, because of some shift, now it's like a little out of place. So local example. Um, so, one person, one writer, Connie Barlow, really dove into this topic, and she's a um, really good writer. I wrote a book that I'll share later, um, but really kind of explained this really well, making it digestible for the public. But she separated, she had these different levels of anachronisms um, that she described. So the first one is like these what's called extreme anachronisms, so things that are very obviously out of place within our time, do not have any real mammal dispersers. Just like, like, what are you doing? Why, why, is this, why does this exist? Um, and then a step down from that, you have substantial anachronisms where the, basically the, tar the target uh, dispersal agent is no longer here, but there are things that might feed on the fruits or maybe take the seeds and like disperse them like moderately, but not as effectively as say like a mastodon or a mammoth would. And then finally you have like these like weaker or moderate anachronisms. So these are things that they do have modern dispersal agents, but they have a couple of traits that are just seem kind of like, mm, why is that necessary? Like something just a little off kilter with them that might make them somewhat anachronistic. And we'll talk about examples of all of these. So other other indicators that like if you're seeing something like of like this seems anachronistic, this might have some this might have some kind of evolutionary partnership that's not there anymore. Um, so one of the biggest ones, the title of this talk that I borrowed from like that's come up a lot is like the riddle or the mystery of the rotting fruit. So again, plants are investing a lot of time and energy into producing these big fleshy fruits. But then why do we just see them rotting on the ground under the parent tree not being dispersed? It's a massive waste of energy, right? Because nothing's there to disperse them anymore. Um, but you can have these species more common where livestock is present. So these like certain cattle and horses and camels um, might act as a proxy for now extinct animals. Again, might not be as effective, but if you have areas with free roaming cattle or horses or something, these species might be able to kind of persist and move around that way. Again, to a limited extent. So often, um, if you look at a range map of where these things are found now, it's like real patchy and weird um, because again, not being dispersed effectively by any, any modern agent. Uh, big one is, um, so that they'll, if you plant these things in an upland habitat, they'll grow, they might grow really well, but you don't really, you only really see them in the wild in like lowlands or floodplains. So why is that? So well, if you have an anachronistic fruit drops on the ground and it doesn't have any dispersal agents uh, in mammals, only thing it can do is roll downhill or uh, maybe a flood will carry it away somewhere and they disperse that way. So we have a few native examples of that that are in the wild. You really only find them in floodplains, but they are they are very uh, well adapted to uplands as well. And then again, like something about it, the fruit or other features just seem like a little extra, right? Like it's a little too much for like why did you do, why did was that necessary? Okay. And if it has fruits that are eat that look like other things like in Asia or Africa that are eaten by other megafauna that we don't have here, that might be an indication. All right, so if you see like a big fruit on the ground in North America, 
that looks like a fruit eaten by these guys that we don't have here, chances are pretty good it was once eaten by these. So things to look for. So we're gonna dive into some specific examples. Um, so this, this species is, uh, this, this whole little story of this, this tree, the Campbell cock, I don't know if I said that right, um, the Sideroxalan, critically endangered understory tree, endative, uh, endemic to one island, the island of Mauritius, um, which also has a lot of other really weird endemic species. But so like this, the story of this tree actually inspired Jansen and Martin to uh, kind of dive into this and publish that paper. So this is kind of the first one that people really paid attention to. Um, but as you can see, uh, understory tropical tree, and in the center here, you have these big old nuts, these big old honking seeds in there. And again, plants need, like the seed needs to be dispersed whole. Like you can't like break up a break up a seed into a bunch of pieces and then those will grow. Like eat, eat, everything that needs to be there is there. So that seed needs to be eaten by something and passed through whole. However, Mauritius does not have any existing native megafauna. What I did have were these. So it, another, another common name for this tree is the dodo tree. It was once thought that dodos were the uh, primary dispersal agent of this of this plant. Um, and in fact, the, the first guy that really wrote about this said like, this tree needs dodos to survive. Then other people said, well, I mean, I, it, dodos were important, but you know, these giant tortoises were also very important dispersers of this tree. And if you are familiar with at least one of these or the history of European exploration, you probably know what happened next, right? Um, so yeah, Dutch explorers clubbed all the dodos to death, killed off most of the giant tortoises. Um, so of course these, there are still some giant extant giant tortoises on Mauritius, but they are also endangered. So this tree lost its, primary dispersers. Um, so that coupled with other factors like uh, introduced fungal diseases and habitat loss, just all reasons why it is not doing so hot right now. Another one is the avocado, right? So um, you're all familiar with avocados probably, especially all the millennials in the room. Because uh, that's why we can't afford houses anymore. Uh, but large, big, big old large seeds surrounded by this really nutritiously dense pulp. Now, obviously, this is a cultivated avocado that's on the screen here. Um, but the wild types still had that large, like they didn't make the seed bigger. Like that's what the seed is. Um, and again, fruits, ideally to be dispersed, that seed needs to be swallowed whole and passed whole and without a great amount of discomfort, correct? <laughs> so, so it's thought that these were just likely eaten and dispersed by giant ground sloths in the native range that could just like go under an avocado tree, scoop a bunch up and just disperse them out. Um, obviously giant ground sloths are no longer a thing. So the avocado has lost its also lost its primary uh, intended dispersal agent. So now it's just, so now, I mean, obviously humans, since we like avocado so much, we have done a great job at dispersing it, but naturally um, it's only one animal that disperses avocado. Any guesses? Capybara. No. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, nah, not big enough. Tapers aren't big enough. So the only animals that just only animal that's uh, known to naturally disperse avocados are jaguars. Mm -hmm. So jaguars actually go after like the oily flesh, and they will, <laughs> <laughs> and they will actually uh, eat eat and pass whole avocados, and they probably make that face when they're doing it. <laughs> um, so, but obviously, this like carnivore teeth were not meant to, you know eat fruit. So this is an unintended dispersal agent, but still very good. Um, also, I needed a picture of a jaguar with its mouth open. So I just Googled jaguars yawning and uh -huh. they were just funny to me. So another thing, another thing you can look up, uh, you know, if you have the time. <laughs> um, 
Probably one of the biggest anachronistic plants is the ginkgo. Um, so only one of the species, ginkgo biloba, that's existed as the same species for the past couple million years, which is really ridiculous. Like you would think at some point they would have speciated, but nope, it's just, it's just been this that whole time. And that's due to a lot of things. So they um, are relatively slow to reproduce and they live for a very long time and they can re-sprout and regrow if the trunks are damaged. So like that extreme longevity and the slow reproduction means the trees don't really need to change all that much. They're just fine, fine the way they are. And the only the only natural occurrence is this small area of the mountains of eastern China where it's thought they were they would have probably gone extinct if they weren't uh, cultivated by Buddhist monks. So if you have ginkgos in your neighborhood or in your park, you can thank uh, 16th century monks for keeping this thing alive mm -hmm. for a few hundred years until it eventually became more widely cultivated. And if you've ever been around a female ginkgo when it's dropped its fruits, you know they smell a little bad and they just tend to lay on the ground everywhere and people step on them mm -hmm. and it makes a big mess. But it's thought that they likely evolved um, with scavenging dinosaurs and small mammals to disperse their seeds smelling like that. So some more contemporary examples that you will actually see like around here. Um, so most obvious one is Yosei Dorj, uh, probably one of my favorite trees. It's just, it's just a cool tree, but uh, you've probably seen the hedge apples around at some point, these big, thick, rubbery, uh, not good tasting fruits that if you've ever broken one open, it's in the mulberry family. So it's full of the sticky latex and it's just not very good. Um, not very good eating, really restricted uh, native range, um, but it is found all over the place because it was cultivated by uh, indigenous Americans who valued it. It's used for bow wood and um, European colonists who use it for like fence posts and things like that and hedgerows because it's a very strong, dense wood and really good for building stuff. So here's a distribution map. So the uh, little, the little light lime green counties are its native range and the light blue is where it has been dispersed historically by people. So the reason people whine that it's not actually a Missouri native tree it's because it wasn't actually dispersed here naturally. It was brought by most likely indigenous Americans. Um, so yeah, this kind of, and you could see in like, even where, and so you could see like this kind of weird patchy distribution um, that it, that would indicate that its main, its primary dispersal agent is no longer here. Oops. So, and if this species is only native to North America, but there are no native animals that will eat and disperse the, the seeds effectively. Um, like you'll see this, you've probably seen squirrels gnawing on it when they have to. Um, I don't think it's very appetizing, but you can see it's just like similar with the pumpkin, really big fruit, the squirrel's just kind of eating it in place, like digging around, making a big nest, probably destroying most of the seeds and then leaving the rest to rot. So it does not make a whole lot of sense for uh, like the plant to produce that big of a fruit just for a squirrel to do this. And even like uh, things like deer, like deer won't, deer might also eat it, I don't know. Um, but again, like they have like, they have pretty small narrow muzzles they are most likely not dispersing this effectively either. But if you take a hedge apple and put it on a mastodon molar, then it kind of makes sense, right? So this is, oh, now, it's, now this, is, this has context. So you can see oh, that's, that's probably what it was meant for, not for squirrels to make a mess in the park. And then also like there, it has relatives in Asian Africa that are eaten by existing meta megafauna, particularly elephants and um, rhinos. So this is a breadfruit and a jackfruit, um, same family. You can see very similar structure to a Osage orange and um, eaten currently by existing megafauna. Here's a little example. Yum, yum. This is how that fruit was meant to be dispersed, right? 
you want a big, big old maw to pop that whole thing in there and just effortlessly disperse the seeds. Also, I don't know if any of you have tried to process a whole jackfruit before. It is a giant, messy pain. <laughs> so this, this elephant's having a good time. What was the first fruit you said for something that a jackfruit? Uh, breadfruit. Breadfruit, yeah. So Because it has that fibery, that, I mean, some, if you've ever seen jackfruit, breadfruit has like that fibery texture, reminiscent of bread. Okay, another native anachronism is the Kentucky coffee tree. Um, so we got these thick, leathery pods filled with a very sweet pulp and very, very hard, dense seeds, and that nothing really eats. So if you like the coffee trees here or elsewhere, you'll see just the pods all over the ground because nothing's really going after them. And this is also one that's found in floodplains a lot, even though it does grow well in upland areas. It doesn't disperse naturally in uplands really anymore. So primary areas where it's found, at least around here, always, are usually lowlands or floodplains. That's why it does well. And um, so if you take if you take these and offer them to like put them out for squirrels or deer, they'll probably be left alone. But if you take them to the zoo and give them to the rhinos, they're gonna love them. They will like just gobble up those whole pods and disperse the seeds. And then you'll have the zoo staff wondering, like, why are there coffee trees coming up in the rhino pen? It's like, well, they're supposed to be there. Uh, another, another one is, so persimmon comes up a lot. It's a little bit weird. Um, so kind of considered like the weaker, moderate anachronism side. So the fruits are eaten and dispersed by a lot of native animals. Um, so raccoons, foxes, possums will eat them. Deer will eat them. Um, one of the best ones are bears. Um, so these, so like the smaller omnivores, well, first of all, like if you've been under per, like ripe persimmons, you know, you don't pick them off the tree. You wait till they fall on the ground. So you look for persimmons. They're like all over the ground. They're like really mushy. That's when they're good. Um, so these smaller omnivores generally will come up, eat some of it in place and probably will leave a lot, leave some of the pulp and seeds around. Um, so not as good, not as good at dispersers. Um, bears, bears will generally eat the whole fruit. Bears are great dispersers for it. But uh, one thing to remember is like a lot of these smaller animals, these raccoons, foxes, and possums, um, weren't as abundant like during the Pleistocene era. The only reason we have so many raccoons and possums and whatnot is because we killed off a lot of the wolves and we don't have saber-toothed cats anymore. So these predators that would have kept the populations in check are not around. So we have higher numbers than would have been present in uh, during the Pleistocene while persimmons were evolving. So it's thought that like all those fruits on the ground, most of them would have been sucked up by mammoths or mastodons. And then these little guys would have been basically scrounging for whatever's left. So that's why people say it's a little bit anachronistic. Um, papa, everyone's favorite native native delicacy. So you got large fruit, big hard seeds, again, that have that slippery coating on the outside. So they're really hard to like extract from the pulp. Um, if you tried baking with papa before, you try, you know it's a giant pain to get those to get the seeds out of the pulp. So sometimes I just give up and just Somebody's get somebody's biting into a seed. I don't care. <laughs> it's just too much work. Um, and like you know, like, like for our consumption, you know, they have a very short window to collect pawpaws, and they drop, and you have about a couple days before they start to get really, really ripe. And like a little, you like if you walk if you've ever walked under a pawpaw grove during pawpaw season, you usually smell the fermenting fruits before you see them in the trees. Which again is an might be an adaptation to attract mam to attract these large mammals that will smell these fruits and be like, oh, there's food. And bonus if it has a bunch of maggots and bugs in it, because that's just extra protein. So if you, the real way to eat pawpaws is just eat it with the bugs in there. <laughs> a lot of animals do eat the fruits, but again, 
not as effective dispersers. So like, like things like the small omnivores, again, which wouldn't have been as common, and deer that will go after the fruits, but um, the size, like the size, if you think about the size of the average pawpaw fruit, it's a little bigger than like a deer mouth. Yeah. So like, why would you, if you're a plant, why, why invest energy in making a fruit that's bigger than the mouth of the thing that you want to disperse your seeds? So like the deer will just like eat them off the ground. But again, these are more, more than likely uh, evolved to uh, larger animals that will just like suck them up and move on and disperse the seeds elsewhere. Another one is honey locusts. So if you've seen these, they're, really, they're planted street trees a lot. So it's got these large foot long bean pods um, that are filled with like, this protein rich sweet pulp. Um, really thick hard seeds that you really need to like scarify or eat and poop out before they'll germinate. Um, and found in flood plains, cause like unlike most legumes, most legumes will split open and like the seeds will fall out that way. These generally stay sealed and that allows them to float. So they disperse in the flood plains. So obviously again, large fruit, hard seeds, probably megafaunal traits. Also, they are very, very pokey. So they need to, that's, that's just ridiculous, right? Like if you're, so ideally plants, trees like evolved thorns to ward off browsers, which here again is probably, probably your biggest extant browsers are deer, but like I, I'm not a huge fan of deer, but even that seems like overkill to me. And they tend, and they still produce these thorns higher up in the trunk where deer aren't going to reach them. So like, there's doesn't really seem to be a reason for it. Oh, these are some funny comments on Reddit. I especially like the guy that compared these trees to Burt Gummer from the Tremor series. Um, it's just, just ex it's just it's just a little too extra unless you put it in the context of megafauna, right? So if you have big pokey trunk like trunks and branches. Um, like way up in the can to be out of the reach of extant megafauna or extant herbivores, that means it's probably meant for something bigger. So if you want big animals to come and eat your bean pot, but you don't want them to eat your branches, they probably need these big, big old swords everywhere. Go back to where you have the scientific name, please. Because that, when you take like dendrology and you're doing taxonomy, that this is on the side. I'm sorry, it's <laughs> geeky, but Gladitia tricanthos is just the best name. It's so fun to say, and it means three <laughs> thorns, and it's easy to remember. And I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> no, it's fine. See, no, the tricanthos. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the picture that that this guy on Etsy was like selling these for like people to like make stuff with. So if you need a side hustle, start planting some honey locusts. Another one is hawthorns. So hawthorns will have these big, oh, some other pieces of these big pokey thorns. Um, but then it's like these berries are small and brightly colored. So primarily probably to attract birds. Um, so you can see like those thorns are spaced out far enough to where birds can still get in there. And even deer, like deer have like that, again, that narrow muzzle they can get in between those thorns and get and get the fruits if they need to and maybe do some browsing. So probably not meant for them. It's probably again meant for something something bigger. And another one that came up a couple of times was Aurelia spinosa. Anyone familiar with Devil's Walking Stick? Like tree sub shrub, mm -hmm. uh, real. They're not really big, but they're still they still hurt these big angry point, pointy thorns like all along the stem that tend to again be higher up the stem than deer would be able to reach. So um, probably like a weaker, probably like a really very weak anachronistic trait, but you know, just something interesting like why why make thorns that high up? That's unnecessary. Um, but yeah, so and if you're interested in this, um, you can look up various writings by Dan James and Paul Martin. Like, tell them they've had they've had a bunch of papers, a bunch of different articles that they've written about the subject. And um, the book that inspired me, uh, "Ghosts of Evolution" by Connie Barlow, basically, she kind of distills 
all of the information uh, published out there and makes it digestible. So this is a really, really good, interesting book um, that you don't need to be like an expert biologist to like really digest. And I really like like the symbolism, like the ghosts of evolution, or you like you'll see like articles like anachronistic fruits and the ghosts that haunt them. So like these, you see the you uh, it's just a cool imagery. Like you see like these fruits on the ground, and then you just like imagine them being like haunted by the shadows of like these extinct megafauna so it's, oh. it's a cool concept and she also talks about like going into like like aisles of the grocery store and seeing like the ghosts of like uh giant sloths like picking the fruits up so just a cool imagery i think and that's it and i'll take any questions Not been paying attention to the chat. It doesn't look like it. No questions. Everybody understood all that. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's not a question, but the school that was out here yesterday about the weather today is National Park Day. So ah. Uh, unfortunately, oh, what we got? Something here. Oh, thank, thank you, Lynn. So unfortunately, I didn't. I did, was not able to gather a bunch of pawpaws for you guys. Um, That's the worst. You see it on the frame. Yeah. yeah. So these are falling. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're they're usually like in like the the substantial like that mid-range most people will consider them in there um again i mean it's subjective it's just like how how much do you really want to think about it so for our volunteers visiting the education volunteers where can they go to see on site some of like what trees we have here what, that are at least available for them to see while they're here with kids um so we do have pawpaws um Obviously, I don't know if we have any fruiting persimmons. Um, we have some, we do have some persimmon trees, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we do have, we do have Kentucky coffee trees. There's one, there's a really big one right off the driveway, it's loaded with pods right now. Are the coffee tree ones long and skinny or short and fat? Um, they're they're like short and thick. And actually, so for the people here in this room, I did collect a bunch of Kentucky coffee tree seeds and make coffee with them. So it's in the pot in the back oh, if you want to try it. Hmm? It kind of tastes like gross coffee. I don't know. <laughs> I've Not the best coffee, but you say this before I have tasted this bad. I would say <laughs> to me it tastes the, the, the opinion of like black coffee. Yeah. So I if you like black coffee, it tasted like that. But as soon as I put cream in it, I kind of didn't taste like black coffee with cream. Yeah. <laughs> like so. Um question uh, um the fact that these uh large metaphon are not uh, dispersing these plants anymore? Why are they That's a good question. So the question is like, basically if these things aren't getting dispersed, why are they still around? Um, and there's, I mean, basically it comes down to, they've just been, they've, a lot of them have certain adaptations to where they can persist in the landscape. Um, again, being found in floodplains where like water could disperse the seeds, um, is a big one. Also, a lot of them tend to be clonal. So if you damage, if the stem gets damp, if the main stem gets damaged in any way, it can re-sprout and send up new ones. So papa obviously does that. Um, coffee, persimmons do it. Coffee trees do it. Osage orange does it. So these, so, so they, like, I was going to put that in there, but I, I don't know if it was like a I would call it a distinguishing feature. It's just like something they have in common. Is it possible that plants are able to um, 
who live longer than they may have. They can exist for many more millions of years than. Right. So, yeah. So, question is it do plants like generally live longer than mammals? Well, yeah. So, you have trees that are many thousands of years old, especially like the ginkgos, um, that are pretty well adapted to their local conditions. And which is also why, so like again, these animals died out. Like that extinction, like the end of that extinction was 10,000 years ago which again, on an evolutionary time scale is like real quick, not nearly enough time for these plants to readapt their traits and like start uh, changing for like current conditions. Right. And a lot of these, a lot of these are now like uh, cultivated by people. So now we are the ones dispersing and maintaining those species. So again, plants rule. If the plants weren't here, we wouldn't. True. Plants do, in fact, rule. <laughs> <laughs> but because we're cultivating them, not but, but because we cultivate them, and so we are helping to extend them. Yeah, but we're not allowing them to adapt to the the climate and the conditions under which those seeds are dispersed because we're kind of stopping the evolution at that point and putting them in our yard or on the street. And then they die and we cut them down. We don't, we sweep up the seeds and put them somewhere else. Yeah. But the guys, There's, the ones that yeah. float down the mm -hmm. plane, there's a chance that then the adaptations can occur that allow it. So it's like, so I mean, like basically, we are stagnating their evolution. That's, that's what you're saying, saying. yeah. Um, which, well, that's a whole other thing. We can talk about that all day if you want. <laughs> There's lots of lots of interesting theories. Um, if you ever read the book Botany of Desire by Michael Pollan, he goes into that a little bit. Um, it's kind of like, are we using the plants, or the plants using us? It's kind of this weird thought to have. But yeah, that's a good. That is a good point. Yeah, an example I can think of just right off the bat is like how Adam was showing you the fall claws, you know, with like the bite size of a deer out there. If you remove humans to the equation, like we didn't exist, and the fall claws lost all their sources except for like deer, eventually fall claws probably would have selected over time to right. for the smaller fruits that would have bitten deer's mouths, right. something like that. But right. we've been able to allow big fruited fall claws to keep on going. Yes. Yes. That their evolution and pressure on these trees to have more buoyant fruits. Um, is there evolutionary pressure on the trees to have more buoyant? I mean, now there is, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, if, if you're found in a floodplain, you better handle water pretty well. Um, and like the honey locusts, like since those pods are sealed, like they tend to float pretty good. Um, the coffee tree pods, I don't think they're completely sealed, but I mean, they seem to do okay, like just being deposited. And plus like the moisture helps those seed pods decompose quicker and like get the seed into the soil better, probably. So you have to, you have to check back in a couple million years and see, yeah. <laughs> yeah. see what's going on with these species. Okay. Online. I can't see the chat anymore. Okay, so we got to help here. Uh, fruits, we get grocery, not able to germinate. Um, well, I, I mean, it depends on, you know, what kind of fruit it is and where you're getting the groceries, right? Um, so a lot of, sometimes like, uh, like if you go to like a schnooks or something, like those fruits will go, undergo some kind of like, I don't know, I can't remember if it's like pasteurization or sterilization, but most things you get at like a schnooks probably won't grow if you tried to germinate them. Um, that being said, like I've grown stuff from grocery store fruits. If you go to like a farmer's market or something or like a smaller like uh, like import food store that might have might have like more 
like wild type fruits, like you could potentially germinate. I mean, go ahead and try. Why not? That's that's free plants. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you can grow you can grow avocados. Um, I think some of like the, the those big like California avocados sometimes they tend to be a little they tend to be sterile. Um, but yeah, you can grow avocados. You could probably you could probably grow lemons or anything. Yeah, next that's that's free house plants. So yeah, go for it. Uh, are there examples of animals catching up in evolution to spread seeds to a particular part? Um, I mean, things in the in the case of like the per, like that'd be like things like the persimmon, right? So you have these like small animals and bears that will eat and disperse the seed, even though they were. It's unlikely they were the primary uh, dispersal agent again when these fruits evolved, right? So, yeah, entirely possible they can adapt. Bears are. Wide range of yeah, also, yes. Yeah. We don't have, for some reason, we don't like bears running around the city. <laughs> All right, and then last question is Can I unmute myself and tell you how fabulous this was? Oh, uh, yeah, go for it. I, I, do I have to do it? That's Diane. Uh, I, I, I can't type fast enough to tell you how much this was, this was fabulous. fabulous. Mm -hmm. so, uh, thank you, so, 16th century monks, a hedge apple on a mastodon's molar. An elephant eating a breadfruit, jaguars yawning. I mean, that last slide of the Osage ap apples on the ground, and then all of a sudden the ghosts of the Pleistocene era uh, mammals appearing. That was so. I, I learned how to do that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adam. You are always creative, knowledgeable. Uh, you, you just bring things to life for us in, in, in a very unique way. Oh, you're going to make me blush. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Any other questions or flattering comments? Have you been watching the evolution series on PBS? Oh no, I haven't actually. It's bad for me. Stop the sharing now. There you go. Um, oh, real quick before everyone goes, hold on. Hold on. I don't have paw pods, but I do have another mammal, another mammal dispersed fruit that I showed earlier in my presentation. Does anybody know what this is? No. Close. Is it, bread? it is not a breadfruit. Not a breadfruit. Yeah, not a breadfruit. Not a breadfruit. Oh, it's the thing at the beginning. Yeah, it's the thing at the beginning. This is a durian. Um, so, well, here's the thing. Um, so, y'all on the Zoom are lucky that you don't have to deal with this right now. <laughs> so, notorious. It's a southeastern Asian delicacy. Uh, also, notoriously like a little bit funky. Um, I do have it, and so, you can, so this is, I mean, obviously, you can see that this was, this is most likely evolved, you can see on the zoom here, Boop. most likely evolved to, for like something with a large mouth and big teeth to eat this thing. So, well, it's probably elephants, but yeah. <laughs> um, so I do, and I do have a saw to open it if anybody wants to try some. Well, Won't know that until I actually open it. <laughs> yeah, probably. Durian. D U R I N. Yeah, I <laughs> just in the in the meeting. Yeah. All right. Um. But thank you for everyone on the Zoom for tuning in. Hope hope you learned something. Uh. Again, like really cool topic. Really cool topic. Feel free to talk to me about it anytime. We could we could talk for days. Lot to dive into.